smart kid. Uh, raised in a home with faith, with prayer to Jesus. And, and his dream was to become a physician. He wanted to be a doctor. And, and so when he got through, and then in the high school days, he took the SATs. And this the young man actually scored the highest SAT score in 20 years in all of the Detroit area where he was from. And so he wanted to apply to a college. And his family had enough money $10 to pay for one application. They were a very poor family. So he applied to Yale with his one application and got in and got a full ride for four years at Yale. In his first semester, as sometimes happens with first semester college students, he was struggling in his chemistry class. And he knew he had to pass the chemistry class to go on and do the program to become a doctor. And he was actually looking like he was going to fail out of the class. He had his final, and he had to basically ace and nail the final to do well enough to pass chemistry to go on and keep moving towards becoming a physician. And so he prayed. And then he decided to pull an all-nighter and study all night long as, and this is before monster drinks and all these different caffeinated drinks. This is, and he decided he was going to study all night long to get ready for the exam. But when he started studying, he fell asleep. And as he slept, he dreamed. And he had a strange dream that he was alone in a classroom. And there was this figure up in the front, he couldn't identify who it was, at a blackboard writing out chemistry problems and answers. And another chemistry problem and answer. And another chemistry problem and answer. That was his dream. I'll read for you what he wrote happened the next morning. He said, when I went to take the test the next morning... It was like the Twilight Zone. If you're not old enough to know what the Twilight Zone is, kind of a weird TV show where like, woo, strange things happen, all right? He said, it was like the Twilight Zone. I recognized the first problem as one of the ones I had dreamed about, the exact problem. And then the next, and the next, and the next. And I aced the exam and got a good mark in chemistry. And I love this. And I promised the Lord he would never have to do that for me again. Not, not, I'm not recommending a new way to get good grades in school because that, that's not the point of this. This young man became a physician. At age 33, he became the youngest director of pediatric neurosurgery in the country. He did a surgery where he separated conjoined twins who were, who were conjoined at the head and the brain, connected. He performed the first successful neurosurgery on a fetus. He developed new methods of treating brain stem and spinal cord tumors. He was awarded the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And in 2014, a, poll, a national poll ranked Benjamin Solomon Carson Sr. as among the 10 most admired people in America. Was that dream and what followed a miracle? Is that miraculous? Well, that's what I want to talk about today. We're starting this five-week series called Supernatural. And today we're looking at the miraculous. And I want, to, I want to try to get some common language and thinking. And I know that some of you won't exactly agree with the way I define things, but try to stay with me at least to get a language that we can think together as we talk about the miraculous. Uh, first, I want to give you some possible definitions. And I think all of these capture some of the sense of what, of what the Bible means by miracles and what we'll be talking about today. What is a miracle? A work brought about by a divine power for a divine purpose by means beyond the reach of man. And that means men or women, beyond human reach. That gets to some of the sense of a miracle. What is a miracle? Here's another definition from Webster's Dictionary. An event or effect in the physical world deviating from the known laws of nature or transcending our knowledge of these laws. An extraordinary, anomalous, or abnormal event brought about by a superhuman agency. They're not saying God, but the idea would be this God who moves beyond what we understand. Here's a third possible definition. What is a miracle? A miracle is an event brought about by the power of God that is a temporary exception to the ordinary course of nature for the purpose of showing that God has acted in history. I would add to that not just showing that God has acted in history, but I would say also showing God's love, showing God's grace, showing God's power. The idea is that God can somehow, when he wants to step into the natural order of things, which, by the way, he set up, and do something different, something surprising. So I'm going to give you three terms, 
three options for how we can define the things that happen in our lives. And I think, if, I think if we understand these terms, we can define everything that we experience in kind of in one of these three categories. One would be a natural occurrence. This is something that's consistent with the laws of the universe as we understand them. Now, let me be clear. As a biblical Christian, I actually believe that the, the laws of the universe themselves were set up by God, who is supernatural. So there's something supernatural about everything. But what I'm talking about is how, how we talk about our lives, what happens. There's some things that happen in the flow of the natural world the way God has set it up. And sometimes we want to call those natural things supernatural, but I would suggest that we would be better off calling them wonderful and incredible, but not necessarily miraculous, because they're set up in the way that God's designed the world to, folk, to flow. So an example would be this. You're standing at the edge of the ocean, and there's this unbelievable, beautiful sunrise or sunset, depending where you are in the world. And you look at and the colors and the majesty, the beauty, and you, and you want to go, that's miraculous. And I would say, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. God's hand is in all things, but there's few things more natural than a sunrise or a sunset. Because if you stand there tomorrow, guess what? It's going to happen again. It's, it's, the, it's the way, that, so it's supernatural that God set up the universe, but it's the natural way that God has caused things to go. Here's another example of something that I would call natural that we sometimes want to call a miracle. A baby is born. And somebody says, oh, that's a miracle. And I would say, is it in the overall sense of God's glory? Yes, but the reality is, go over to Chomp Hospital, hang out, and there'll be a few more of those babies born. Go to any hospital anywhere in the world, and some people's living rooms or bathrooms. And people, I mean, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty natural thing. So there's some things that I would say, that's more the way God set things up that happens naturally. And so there's, there's some things that are natural, a natural occurrence. Second, a coincidence. Something surprising and out of the ordinary but easily explained. Sometimes there's things that happen that are just kind of a coincidence. Now, I understand that God's on the throne and God rules the universe. I get that. But I'm saying just in the flow of life, you go, well, does that, would I have to call that a miracle? So here's an example. Shortly before I started preparing for this sermon, in this sermon series, I probably used three or four books that I studied for each of the sermons in this series along with the Bible just to learn some things. And I got in the mail a copy of The Case for Miracles by Lee Strobel, who's a friend of this church. He's going to be speaking here and preaching here this year, and, uh, and a personal friend, and it says an advanced reading copy, meaning it's before the book was released. And I get this right before I start to prepare a series on miracles. So I can say, it's a miracle. But I actually think it's a coincidence. I don't, I don't when something like that happens, I don't just like jump to, miracle. You know, I'm not like every, I'm careful before I call something a miracle. Because here's the thing. Could it be a miraculous divine intervention of God that I got this before this message? Of course it could be. Yeah, it could be. But it also could be just that that's when Lee had the book being released and, the, and Zondervan sends me most of their new books to look at and review. And so it could be just that it happened. So I'm not going to jump to miracle too quickly. I'm going to say there's some things that could be a coincidence. That's just for myself. I'm driving down the road and I get a flat tire and I pull off the road. And the person right behind me happens to know me. They recognize my car. They pull over and they have everything I need to get me back on the road. It's a... Yeah, see? Yeah, see? You're not... <laughs> you go, well, could it be that God divinely intervened? Could it be a miracle? It could be. But it also could just be a coincidence that they happen to be behind me. So, I'm, so on those things, I'm going to be careful before I jump to miracle because I want to be clear when I talk about a miracle what I mean. All right? So there's some things that are natural occurrences. There's some things that are coincidences. Here's the third category. A supernatural occurrence. Something miraculous. Something that can't be explained by natural law, which has been set up by God, or by coincidence. So, Ben Carson's dream, the night before when he prayed, God, I need to pass this class, and he has a dream that basically this figure writes out all the problems that are going to be on his exam. Not a natural occurrence. I don't think you can qualify that as coincidence. I would say miracle. I would say th th there's a, a divine intervention that's happening there. Uh, when I was a, a pastor down in uh, Glendora, California, down in Southern California, years ago, first, first church I pastored, I was actually there through my last year of college, through my three years of seminary, and for three years after seminary. And so it was, it was my first church I was part of as a leader in the church. And we had our church board, and one of the guys on the church board named Lou uh, got stomach cancer. Now this guy is like the most un inexpressive, uncharismatic guy you will meet in your life. He didn't like grow up in a church where there's you know, healing and prayers for healing. He was like, that was all kind of just, but he, but he got this stomach cancer and he said to our church board, he said, you know, he said, I got the stomach cancer and the Bible says we're supposed to pray for people who are sick and so would you guys do what the Bible says and 
lay hands on me and anoint me and pray for my healing. And he said, we'll see what happens. He said, he said we should do it because the Bible says so. So our elder board got around him. We anointed him with oil in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be a sense of God's presence because if anything happens, God gets the glory. And we prayed over him. And we prayed, not demanding what God has to do, but humbly asking with deep faith, God, if you desire to heal, you can heal, you can touch his body, and we ask for God's healing. When we finished praying and said amen, this very unemotional guy says, you guys are gonna think this is really weird. And I said, what? He said, well, when you were praying, it felt like these hot hands went inside my stomach and was pushing stuff around. And we were all like, hmm, okay. A couple days later, we went back to the doctor. All the cancer's gone. All of it. Natural occurrence? No. Sometimes there's remissions that happen over time, but like that? No. Coincidence? No way. Miracle? Absolutely. So when we, when, we, when we talk, when I'm talking today, I'm talking about those kinds of things that it might be a coincidence that God's hand is in that. I think God's hand's in everything. But I'm talking about those things where it's clearly not a natural occurrence. It's not a coincidence. It, you, you go, this has clearly crossed the line into the world of the miraculous, into the world of the supernatural. Now, I believe that miracles happen a lot more than most of us realize. I actually believe that, that God does more than what we notice and pay attention to. Pastor Timothy Keller, who's a pastor on the East Coast in the United States here, great thinker, he wrote this. There is nothing illogical about miracles if a creator God exists. If a God exists who is big enough to create the universe in all its complexity and vastness, why should a mere miracle be such a mental stretch? What's the point? He's saying, if you believe in a God who spoke and everything came into existence, doing one small thing to kind of intervene in the way he set up the universe and do something differently, why would we be amazed that God could do something like that? We should actually, I think we should actually expect it. And, and so, so I don't think we should look at miracles as something that are strange, but also, but, but more as something that God does because of who he is. Miracles were normative in biblical times. You read the Bible and you realize that in the biblical times as people walked with God, they saw God do miracles. All kinds of examples. Manna and quail. God's people are in the wilderness for 40 years. In the wilderness, there's not a lot of food laying around. But God literally rains cereal from heaven each morning and sends quail in so that they can have cereal and meat to eat. And that continues on as long as they need it. And when they don't need it anymore, it stops. Natural occurrence? Nope. Coincidence? I don't think so. Miracle? Absolutely. Elijah, one of the great prophets in the Old Testament, is in this conflict with these false prophets, and there's kind of this, this uh, prophet kind of battle on Mount Carmel, and he has this offering set up on these rocks, and the water poured over it to make the point that it just, it's drenched, and he prays, and lightning comes, fire falls from heaven, and it consumes not just the offering, but all the water and the rocks, boom, gone. Natural occurrence? Nope. Coincidence? Nope. Miraculous. Elisha, the protege of Elijah who followed him, and this is one of the stories that we'll look at when we talk about angels and demons and Satan in another one of our supernatural messages. Uh, but th this story in 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha's in the city, the city of Dothan with his servant. They're getting ready to leave the next morning, and the army of the Arameans have found out that Elisha's there, so they come and they literally surround the city because they want to kill Elisha. And so his servant looks, and, and he sees they're trapped in the city, and literally 360 degrees around them, there is an army of their enemies waiting to kill them. He's terrified. And Elisha's kind of calm, cool, and collected. And he just prays, Lord, open his eyes. He says, God, open the eyes of my servant. And all of a sudden, the whole picture changed because he could see the enemy all around them, but all around the enemy was the angels of heaven, the army of God surrounding the enemy. And then he, he, he declared the profound theological statement, oh, <laughs> I understand why Elisha's so relaxed. Because Elisha saw the spiritual reality and he couldn't see it. That's miraculous. Daniel, thrown into lions who are hungry and they don't eat them. Daniel's friends, thrown into a furnace and they're not burned to death. Jesus, walking on the water. Peter, getting out of the boat and walking towards Jesus. And he gets a couple of steps on the water, sees the wind, the waves kind of freaks out and starts to sink. And everybody's like, oh man, Peter lacks faith. Guess what? I've never walked one or two steps on the water. 
I'm pretty impressed with Peter. He got a couple steps in before he started sinking, right? But miraculous, absolutely. Jesus, you know, casting out demons. Jesus healing the sick. Jesus declaring things that, that, that we couldn't comprehend and doing things we couldn't understand. And ultimately, the resurrection of Jesus, that he who was dead was now alive. And then the New Testament church in the book of Acts, God doing miracles. This was normal. This was part of how things went. And so I, I want to challenge us, if we look at the word of God and if we believe this is true and we believe that God does miracles or did miracles, we should actually believe, believe that God still does miracles. Miracles still happen today. I believe that. And I believe if we pay attention, we're going to see more of what God is doing than we presently see. We have to be open to that and be aware of that. And again, I'm not talking about everything, every sunrise is a miracle. I'm not talking about every flat tire fix is a miracle. I'm talking about stuff that breaks those things into a place where you go, that has to be a miraculous work of God. Uh, for Sherry and I, we've had a, a few experiences in our own lives that, that I would say I qualify as nothing other than miraculous. And so we had an experience where we were actually, I was pastoring a church in Michigan, uh, Corinth Reformed Church, had been there for 13, almost 14 years. I love that church like I love Shoreline. I, mean, I, I love that church. I love those people. I love being there. I felt called there. And they'd given me a certain amount of time each year to travel and do ministry in other churches, even as Shoreline does. So Sherry and I were driving from Grand Rapids, Michigan to Chicago, about a, about a two and a half, three hour drive. And as we're driving, we were talking about how much we love the church and how comfortable we felt there and that, that we felt like, man, we could spend the rest of our ministry at that church in West Michigan. And Sherry actually says to me, she says, I really think we could retire at this church. And we, so, so I mean, we felt comfortable there. We get to this church that we're, I'm going to preach at, and they're like Shirley, they had three morning services. And in the middle of service, just like this service, something happened. And it was interesting because Sherry and I always sit next to each other in church. And you all think that Sherry comes to second service because she's always here. But Sherry actually comes to first service and second service and third service because she loves my preaching. You should consider doing it yourself. No. Um, <laughs> there's not enough room in this service. So yeah, but, 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 you know, but Sherry, you know, we're, we're, we, we always sit together in church. But I got put in a certain seat, and she ended up on the other side of the worship center. So it was very rare in church that we're not together, but we were in separate spots. Second service during the singing time, during the music time. In my heart, as clearly as I can hear God speak. And I've never heard God like with my ears, Kevin, do this. Although some people have that, and that's fine with me. God can do whatever he wants. But I've never had that. But I'm talking as clear in my heart as if you were talking to me saying, Kevin, and it was absolutely clear. This is what God put in my heart. Your time at Corinth is ending. That was the church I was serving. The church we were talking about the whole drive over about how much we loved and we would probably never leave there. And God says, your time at Corinth is ending. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. Okay, I gotta preach. So I got up to preach, preached that service, did the third service. And as we're leaving the church to drive back to Michigan, I'm kind of driving out and I'm like, I gotta, talk to this. I gotta talk to Sherry about this and focused. So I, instead of turning out on the parking lot, I turned into the parking lot and parked. And Sherry said, what are you doing? I said, we gotta talk about something. Something ha happened today. And I said, I said, we were sitting in church and I, I heard God tell me, put on my heart, our time at Corinth is ending. And she says, when did you hear that? And I said, in the second service. She said, when in the service? I said, during the, the, work, the praise music. And she said, God told me the, exactly the same thing. He said, I heard those words, your time at Corinth is ending. She said, I actually said, what? And God said again, my time at Corinth is ending. And we actually wept. And I eventually started driving home and Sherry kind of cried for the next two and a half or three hours because we didn't want to, we loved that church. But God allowed us to pour out our hearts and say, okay, God, what's the next thing? That was what prepared the way for us to come and be here. Natural occurrence? No. Coincidence? No way. Miraculous. Absolutely. Now, we don't have those things happen like every week, which would be cool if they did, but we, this is like every five or ten years, kind of a, something like that. But lots of other smaller things where we see God breaking beyond normal experience. Uh, Lee Strobel, when he worked on this book, and actually, I'm, I'm, most of you, I don't know, if, there's only ten reviews on Amazon on this book already, so it I mean, just released. And we'll get some copies to have in our book, in our book area soon, uh, but it just came out. But in this book, uh, Lee actually commissioned a study of Americans, not American Christians, but Americans, about their view of miracles. And he hired the Barner Research Group, did an extensive study, and here's some things they learned in this study. 51% of adults in the U.S. believe the miracles in the Bible happened as they are recorded in the Bible. So if you actually still believe the miracles in this book happened the way it says they happened, you're still in the majority, barely. <laughs> For now, 51%. 67% of the people surveyed 
said they believe miracles are possible today. This is Americans overall. 67% of miracles are possible today. 15% said they do not believe miracles can happen today. And 38% said that they have had a personal experience they can only explain as a miracle, which means about 94,782,000 American adults would say, I've experienced a miracle, which means lots, probably lots of you in this room would say, oh yeah, absolutely. I've experienced things that there's no, it, there's no way it was a natural occurrence, no way it was a coincidence, it was clearly God intervening and doing something. There's a study that was done on doctors and miracles by the HCD Research and Lewis Franklin Institute. And they found out that 55% of U.S. physicians have seen results in their patients that they would consider miraculous. 55% would say there's things that happened with my patient that could only be something from outside the natural world. 75% of the doctors surveyed believe miracles can happen today. And this is, a, this is higher than the population in general. I find that interesting. Some people say, well, people who believe in miracles, that's the uneducated, simple people. But doctors believe in miracles more than the average population. It's not an education thing. It's an awareness that something, there's things that are happening that we cannot explain by natural reason. So I want to give you some reasons you should pray for and expect the miraculous in your life. I think you should expect to see miracles in your life. Not just the natural things that happen, not just coincidence, but more. And I think in some cases, we don't even notice when it's happening. And we can pay attention and see where God is at work. So why would you pray for and expect miracles in your life? Here's one reason. Because our primary revelation of how God moves and works, the Bible, presents miraculous and supernatural inbreaking of God into our lives as normative. You read this book and you realize, even though the Bible doesn't record everything that's happened with God's people, it's God's word to us showing how he works and how he moves. And this book is full of this clear sense that God has established a natural order to how the world works, but he has the power and is willing to, at times, intervene within that and do things that can't be explained any other way than the fact that God has intervened and done something that we could not have done. Why pray for and expect miracles? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8 says, our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I know that there are Christians, there are groups that say, you know, I don't believe that God works that way anymore. There was a time where all miracles and all supernatural things stopped, and that's not allowed anymore. It doesn't happen anymore. The problem is, I'm not, excuse me, I'm not comfortable saying what God can and can't do. I'm not going to tell God you can't. And when I've seen and experienced the kinds of things that God has done in all the areas we're going to talk about in these five weeks, I have absolutely no question that God moves outside the boundaries that he himself has set up. Why? Because he made the boundaries. And he can choose how the, the universe works, but he can also choose to work in ways beyond those boundaries. Why pray for and expect miracles in your life? Because we base, we base our faith on a miracle. The very faith we believe in is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was dead, is now alive. He's risen, he's ascended, He's interceding for us. Our whole faith is based on the fact that there is a God who does more than what we can do in and of ourselves. It is foundational to what we believe as Christians. And so we have to understand that. We base our faith on a miracle. Why? Because God wants to show his glory, his love, and his presence. And I do believe that God wants to show his face and show his presence and show his glory and show his power to his children. If we will be aware, if we'll pay attention, if we'll respond to him as he leads, as he speaks, as he moves, as he heals, as he delivers, as God does what only God can do. Now, I want to share with you one more story. Uh, and, this, and the two short stories that I'm sharing out of my own life come because they're the only stories, they're st only stories I can tell my stories and know 100% they're true. I can hear the people and I don't know, you know I, I can assume they're telling the truth, but I can tell you from my standpoint what I've experienced. So I want to tell you about a stretching and challenging miracle. And I want to tell you that Asking God to show up and do miracles is not always uh, the safest thing to do. And it's not always, you're not always going to get the results you want. And so uh, some years ago, the church I was serving in Michigan, we came to a point where we, were gonna, we had a building project in the church where we were going to actually build a whole new office complex and a new worship center and a gym and a whole youth center all at the same time. Massive undertaking. And I was going to come to my board and then to the church and ask everybody to give more money to help this thing happen. Well, as a pastor, I know I have to come before God and say, okay, Lord, if I'm going to lead the congregation, I have to lead by following you first. So I have to be the first one to commit what I'm going to give. 
So I prayed about it a little bit, said, Lord, give me, give me courage, and I came up with a number, and I was gonna, you know, when I came up with a final number, I was gonna talk with Sherry and make sure we you know, get together on it, but I was like, okay, Lord, this is the amount. I, 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 we already tithe to the church. Our first 10% of whatever we earn went to the church. Then we had offerings to a couple different mission groups that we gave on top of our tithe. So now we're gonna have to give, like, not have to, now we're gonna get to give, um, <laughs> uh, uh, we're gonna get to give above our 10% and above our offerings. So I'm praying, what, you know, what would be a, what would challenge us? So I came up with a number that I thought this would stretch us. And that was gonna kind of be my number. And then I was gonna go to the, our elder board and pray with them and challenge them to do the same. And then I realized I hadn't really prayed about it and asked God to stretch me. I had just kind of done what I thought would stretch me. So I prayed about it and I thought, okay, Lord, give me courage, give me strength. I wanna really be bold. And I made this decision, I'm gonna double the amount. Now, when you start doubling numbers, they get bigger really fast. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm gonna double the amount. And, th- and this won't just stretch us. This is like stretch us to where we have to have total faith in God because we can't do this on our own, that kind of faith. But I still hadn't talked to God about it. But I doubled it. I hadn't talked to my wife yet either. Um, and so, and so, so then the day I was going to ask our elders to come to our elders meeting, we were going to, I was going to ask them to get on their knees and to seek the face of God and to pray about, and I, and I was going to ask them, will you pray and say, God, I'm not going to come up with a number. I'm going to ask you to give me an amount to give. And then I realized I hadn't done that. I'd come up with my number. So I prayed and I said, okay, God, what do you want me and Sherry to give? This is what God put on my heart. Double it again. And so I'm like, doing the math, I'm like, okay, that would mean we gotta give our boys, all our boys college saving, they didn't save it, we saved it, but all our boys college saving, all of our personal savings, and we need more money on top of that. We, we, it, it was an amount that we, if we gave everything we had saved in every account, it still wasn't enough to cover this amount of money, and that's what God put on my heart. Then I gotta go talk to my wife. Um, and so I, I sat down with Sherry and said, honey, you know, this thing's coming up for the church. We're gonna do this big thing and, I, and I've been praying about it and I think I have an amount but I want you to pray and let God speak to your heart first before we talk about this. She says, oh, that, she says, that's okay. God already told me how much we're supposed to give. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I was running the other day and I was in this cul-de-sac that I ran in and, right, and I was like, but there's one house and God, and I was praying because I knew that you were gonna talk to me because we'd have to be the first ones to give and we'd have to give the most sacrificially to lead the church. So she says, I was just praying and God said, this is the amount. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to have, I was going to like, okay, okay, now you write it down, and I'll write it down, and then we'll like slowly exchange pieces of paper, you know, I kind of want to do that thing, you know, but, I'm, I'm, but I was like, I was too anxious, I said, well, what, what did God put in your heart? The exact same amount, but it took me going through three processes to get there, it just took her hearing from God and telling her, <laughs> but can I tell you, we emptied our boys' college account. We emptied our personal savings account, nothing in it. And we had to get two or three extra side jobs that God gave us to, to, to give that amount of money. We gave it all. And then, about a year later, halfway through the building project, we had to go back and ask everyone to give again. And you know what God told us at that, that time? Double it again. We had nothing left to give. And we actually, and we both heard the same thing again. We got on our knees next to our bed and we prayed and thanked God that he would speak to us that clearly. And we said, God, we're excited to figure out where this is gonna come from because we have no idea because we don't have the money. And we fulfilled that commitment and all three of our boys made it through college and we're fine. Sometimes when you ask God to do the miraculous, it's not the, ooh, fun, happy miracle, it's the, oh, stretch you like crazy miracle. But we couldn't not do what God called us both to do. I wanna challenge you to open yourself to hear God speak in the wonderful, fun, exciting miracles and also in the challenging, stretching miracles. Now, how do I respond when God does not answer a prayer or give the miracle I desire and ask him for? What do I do when I, okay, I believe in God, I'm gonna pray for miracles, I'm gonna trust God, I'm gonna give him glory if he shows me a miracle, but how do I respond if I pray for a miracle and God doesn't do what I've asked for? Here's what you do. You do exactly what the Apostle Paul did. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, The Apostle Paul says, I was given a thorn in my flesh. We don't know if that was a health issue, some person who was harassing him. We don't know know what that thorn in the flesh was. He doesn't tell us. But I think it's actually, we don't know because for us we can go, well, it could be, we all have different things that are hard that we want to get rid of that don't go away. He said, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. That doesn't sound good at all. Three times, listen to this, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
When you ask for a miracle, when you lift up a prayer, sometimes God says, yes, let me show you. It's a miracle. It's not natural. It's not coincidence. It's a miracle. You go, praise God. He gets the glory. Sometimes God says, I'm wiser than you. You won't understand this, but I'm not doing what you asked for. But what I will give you, rather than the miracle right now, I will give you all the grace you need to make it through. Here's the thing as Christians, it's a win-win. Because when God does the miracle, we say, wow, amazing, God gets the glory. When God says it's not that, the miracle's not the right thing right now, but what I will give you is my presence and my love and my grace and my strength through whatever you face. And sometimes when we go through those times, we go, that's what I really need. I experience Jesus' closeness and his presence and grace in a way I never have before. In either case, God is present and God is glorified. So how should we respond when God shows up and does something supernatural? And miraculous. I mean, how do, how do we respond? Because God does. God shows up. God does things that we can't comprehend. He amazes us with his miraculous hand. How do we respond? First, give him praise. Man, when he does, when, when it's, well, this is not natural. This is not coincidence. This is God doing something beyond the boundaries. God, I praise you. I glorify you. I worship you. I lift up your name. Give him praise when that happens every single time. Second, share your story. Tell someone else, I've got to tell you what God did. This was no natural thing. This is no coincidence. God did a miracle. It will strengthen each other's faith when we share those stories. After I preach a sermon like this or when I talk about something that's happened in my life, people come to me and they'll say, Pastor, Pastor, you know, can I tell you a story? And I'm like, sure. And they're like, okay, I never tell anybody about this. You're gonna think it's kind of weird. And they tell me this amazing thing that God did. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm embarrassed to talk about it. Don't be. Share the stories. I, I know right now, there's people sitting here going, oh man, if I had a microphone, I could tell you a story. And it was not natural, and it was not coincidence. It was God showing up. We have to share those stories. Share it with other Christians to build their faith. Share those stories with people that don't yet know Jesus to let them know that you have experienced the presence and the power and the glory of God. There's power in those stories of God intervening and doing things in our lives where he heals, where he moves, where he delivers, where he sets free, where he provides, where he speaks. Share those stories. And trust him more. The more you see him work, trust him more. The more you see him work, trust him more. You pray for something, he either shows up and does a miracle or he says, my grace is enough, I'm gonna be with you. But in either case, you give him glory and you trust him more. And then dare to ask with greater faith. Keep, keep saying, God, grow my faith, deepen my faith. And when you see God do things that only God can do, trust him for more. Walk in confidence and believe in him. If we, Sherry and I hadn't seen God provide for us in that first gift that we gave to the church, above our other giving, we would have never been able to a year, year and a half later do more than that. But because God had done that and provided for us, when God said, now here's the next mountain to climb, here's the next faith to have. And by, and by the way, coincidence or natural, there was nothing natural in me that wanted to give away that amount of money. You know, that was God, I was like, I'm doing this because God, you have, you have said that you will take care of us. And he didn't say I'll give you more money, but he said I'll take care of you. Okay, I trust you, Lord, I trust you. I want to encourage you, if this topic really kind of gets you thinking, and say, I want to dig more into this, this book. And the, the first, story I read, first story I shared with you about Ben Carson, it's out of the, so you'll, you'll recognize things in there. I learned a lot from Lee and some other books I read, but this is probably the best book I've read on this topic in a long time, and so we'll have some copies here, but you can download it off Amazon and, and get that and read that. But I, want to, I just want to encourage you and challenge you to, to say, God, help me notice and recognize when you're doing things that are supernatural, that are miraculous. Help me know your grace when I ask for you to do something and you say, I'm not gonna do the miracle, but I am gonna give you my presence. Let that be enough for me. And let's just let God grow our faith. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you that you are at work, that you are moving, that you rose from the dead, that God, you set up the whole, you spoke the whole universe into existence. So in a sense, everything that we experience every day is miraculous because you are on the throne and you are sovereign and even you holding the universe together is a statement of your glory and power but Lord, in this life, we pray that we would recognize and notice those supernatural interventions and ways that you move and work that we haven't seen before. Let us glorify you, celebrate you, and lift you up on this journey of faith.